This happened last year. Halloween generally isn't celebrated as much in the UK compared to the US, but a lot of families with young children live on our street, so before the pandemic we usually went trick-or-treating. The little ones dressed up and parents tagged along to make sure they were okay. Those that were particularly safety conscious didn't go beyond our street, but the night was enjoyable nonetheless. Things changed with the pandemic. If I remember correctly, most parts of the UK weren't under heavy social restrictions in October 2020 or 21, but infection rates were high, new lockdowns seemed imminent, and people were worried about getting ill. The government advised against trick-or-treating, although it hadn't been banned. My wife Megan and I easily decided not to take the kids out in 2020. I bought a small bag of Halloween sweets in case any neighbouring children came by, but they didn't. We deliberated over whether to go trick-or-treating in 2021. I asked a few neighbours what their plans were when I saw them in passing, and they said they'd probably give it a miss for another year. Megan was worried people would be offended if they thought it was irresponsible to go door to door during a pandemic, so, with regret, we decided to stay indoors. Our children, Kai, aged six, and Hattie, aged eight, weren't too disappointed. I promised to buy some popcorn and sweets for an evening in front of the telly, probably watching The Nightmare Before Christmas for the umpteenth time. It's one of Hattie's favourites. Halloween fell on the Sunday after half-term. Megan was at work. She's a care assistant in a nursing home for the elderly. I was still working my office job from home, so my hours were more flexible. I took the kids out to buy back-to-school supplies, as well as snacks for our film night. It was starting to get dark when we got home. I was surprised to find a Halloween-themed party bag on the doorstep. I glanced at the neighbouring houses. Most of them had identical bags. I assumed those that didn't had already taken theirs inside. Kai picked up the bag. I quickly took it from his grasp, wanting to make sure it was safe before he opened it. It could have been left by anyone. I peeked inside to find standard Halloween treats. Lollipops, chocolate bars, jelly sweets. There was also a note. It read, Dear Neighbour, Happy Halloween. I'm sorry we can't celebrate in person again this year. Having spoken to many of you, it seems most of us aren't comfortable partaking in our usual tradition of trick-or-treating. Please enjoy the sweeties enclosed. This is called reverse trick-or-treating. Please don't feel the need to send us anything in return. Warmest regards, Luke and Stacy at number five. Luke and Stacy didn't have children but they always got dressed up to greet trick-or-treaters and went above and beyond to make the evening special for neighbouring families. I thought it was kind of them to put the party bags together. However, the niggling doubt as to whether we should be giving the children sweets from people we didn't know very well crossed my mind. I felt this way every year. It's why we tended to stick to our street and Megan always checked the treats to make sure they hadn't been tampered with before letting Kai and Hattie touch anything and we wouldn't allow them to eat unwrapped sweets. I knew I was being overly cautious. It's extremely rare for Halloween sweets to be poisoned. In the most famous case of it happening, the boy's father turned out to be the culprit, using Halloween to try to frame a neighbour. After telling the kids to go indoors and wash their hands, I crossed the road and knocked on Luke and Stacy's door to thank them, but there was no reply. Can I have a sweetie, Daddy? Hattie asked. You need to have your dinner first, I replied. I planned to give them the sweets I bought at the supermarket that evening. I wanted to run it past Megan before allowing them to eat from the party bag. She got home as I was putting the kids to bed. I told her about the reverse trick-or-treating after we'd tucked them in and turned out the lights. This is really nice of them, Megan said, whilst carefully examining a chocolate bar. What's this? she asked, holding out a wrapped item that I hadn't noticed before. I must have mistaken it for another bag of sweets, but it appeared to be a toy called Grow Your Own Alien. I guess it's fitting for Halloween, I muse, putting it in the basket that's supposed to be for bills and urgent paperwork, but ends up full of clutter and trinkets that don't have a place. 
Deeming the Halloween goodies safe for consumption, Megan added them to the food cupboard. The next day, after collecting the kids from school, Luke and Stacy's car still wasn't in their driveway. I rang the doorbell anyway, but unsurprisingly, there was no answer. When the same thing happened the next day, I wrote a note thanking them for the party bag and put it through the letterbox. I took the kids swimming at the weekend. Hi, Joe, I called out to a neighbour as we were getting in the car. He didn't respond. I spoke loudly enough that he should have heard me, but he didn't so much as glance in my direction, so I assumed he wasn't deliberately ignoring me. Maybe he needed a hearing aid. He was getting on in years. The next day, I answered the doorbell to find Joe's wife, Cassandra, on the doorstep. Hi, Tim. Sorry to bother you. It's just, I can't find Joe. I was wondering if you'd seen him. Not since yesterday, I replied. I said hello, but he didn't hear me. The police dismissed me because it's been less than 24 hours, but this isn't like him. He'd never leave without his phone, knowing how worried I'd be. I'll let you know if I hear from him, I assured her, but I knew this was unlikely. I only knew Joe in passing. He wasn't going to confide in me if he was in trouble. The doorbell rang an hour later. I thought it was going to be Cassandra again, but it was Stacy. Ah, Stacy! I wanted to say thank you for the reverse trick-or-treat bag. That's why I popped round. I got your letter and a few thank-you cards from other people on the street, but we didn't send anyone anything for Halloween. We've been away visiting Luke's mum. I rummaged in the paperwork basket to find the note that came with the Halloween bag. I showed it to Stacy. She said, I didn't write this. Neither did Luke. It's weirdly formal, isn't it? We don't talk like that. Why would someone pretend the sweets were from you? I asked. I've got no idea. Maybe there's another Stacy and Luke at number five on another street, and someone delivered the bags to the wrong place. This seemed incredibly unlikely, but I replied, maybe, and wished Stacy a good day. I discussed Stacy's revelation with Megan when she got home from work. We were both flummoxed, but the sweets were harmless. Kai and Hattie had consumed half of them and were still in perfect health. We thought maybe someone wanted to deliver the bags anonymously, although we couldn't think why, and they could have left the note unsigned. It didn't make sense to pretend to be Stacy and Luke. A policeman was at the door the next day. He told us six of our neighbours were now missing. As well as Joe, two couples and a single parent had disappeared, leaving everything behind, including their children. Should we be worried? Are we in danger? Megan asked the officer. We have no reason to think so, but you should stay with family for a while if you're worried. If you stay here, please let us know if you notice anything unusual or any strangers hanging around. We decided to remain at home, but we didn't allow the children to go outside unattended, not even in the garden or driveway. It seemed to be adults that were being targeted, but it's better to be safe than sorry. The teenage son of our next-door neighbour was reported missing the next day. Stacy sent Megan a Facebook message, saying a friend of Luke's that works for the police said CCTV cameras captured the missing people walking out of town alone and seemingly uncoerced, but they were moving in a strange robotic manner. Several of them were without shoes and coats, despite the November cold, but whilst this was odd and alarming, there was nothing to suggest foul play. We contemplated going to stay with Megan's mother, but we'd get on best with her in small doses, and it didn't really seem necessary, so we decided to sleep on it. I was woken in the night by Hattie shaking me. Daddy! Daddy! Wake up! She whispered urgently. I could hear the fear in her tiny voice. What's wrong, sweetheart? She held up a plastic tube. It contained a clear gel-like substance that spilled onto the bedding as Hattie tilted the tube towards me. <gasps> it escaped, she gasped. What escaped, sweetheart? I didn't know what that tube was. I wondered if she'd had a nightmare. The alien! I heard a weird noise and I saw it push the lid off and climb out! I rubbed sleep from my eyes no closer to understanding what was going on. Hattie suddenly shrieked, pointing to something on the duvet. A small shape darted towards me in the darkness. I could feel its feather weight on my legs as it leapt. We didn't have any pets. 
I quickly turned on the bedside lamp to find a jelly-like creature crawling inside Megan's mouth as she slept. I managed to dig my fingers into its slimy body and pull it out. It squirmed in my hand. What is that? A now wide awake Megan screeched. It's the alien, Hattie replied, as if it were obvious. What alien? I found it in the kitchen. After a moment's confusion, I remembered the Grow Your Own Alien toy from the Halloween bag. I thought it was like an ant farm, Hattie wailed. It's okay, sweetie. Go to your brother's room and close the door. Don't come out till I say, Megan instructed, ushering our daughter out of the room as it became increasingly difficult to keep hold of the thing in my hands. It resembled a frog in size and shape, but had no discernible facial features, and there weren't any organs visible inside its clear, gloppy body. Megan ran from the room and returned with a plastic bag. We managed to trap the thing inside. I found an empty shoebox in the cupboard under the stairs, and we sealed the creature in with duct tape. It crashed against the sides, sending the box sliding across the table, but it couldn't get out. This is going to sound crazy, but I think that thing was trying to possess you, I told Megan, half expecting her to make fun of me. Instead, she said, I'm calling the police. Whoever left that trick or treat bag obviously didn't have good intentions. The thing inside the box fell still and silent while we waited for the police to arrive. They opened it to find nothing more than a sticky puddle. They thought we were mad when we told them what had happened but they took the slime away to test for harmful substances after we explained the mysterious circumstances of how the toy came to be in our possession. News got out that Luke and Stacy hadn't sent the Halloween bags. Everyone threw away anything from the bag they hadn't used yet, and fortunately, nobody else disappeared. Hattie spread the word at school about the alien toy. The children took the threat seriously, even if the adults didn't. Hattie said a few other kids from our street also found their alien tube empty. The missing neighbours haven't been located, but their disappearances aren't currently being treated as suspicious because they appeared to have left of their own free will. The police claim they're still working hard to find them. Cassandra and the other families are fighting to keep the case warm, but it's quickly going cold. I inquired about the test results on the slime and was told it had evaporated entirely by the time they got it to the lab. We decided to sell our house. We're currently living in a rented property while we wait for the sale to go through. A couple of Hattie's classmates said their tube contained two aliens. Hattie only saw one in ours, but there could have been another behind. She witnessed just one crawling out of the tube, but two adults weren't missing from several households. We checked the belongings we packed thoroughly and we took a lot to the dump and replaced with new. Our first night in the rental was heavenly. Megan and I didn't have to sleep in shifts, fearful of a second creature, ready and waiting.